Eagle Heights Cathedral, welcome to our Christmas celebration service. We are so excited that you have decided to kick off this holiday weekend with us. I want to remind you that we have special New Year's Eve services on Saturday, December 31st at 6 p.m. and 8 p.m. For more information, you can visit our website, ehdonline.org, or call us at 781-284-0670. Now join us as we lift up holy hands and glorify the King of Kings. Saints, would you stand to your feet and give God your best praise? Father, we thank you tonight in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your grand idea to rescue us. Thank you, God, that you had an idea where we could be forgiven of our sins, come back into right relationship with you, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and live our best life now. So we come tonight to celebrate what you did in the name of Jesus. And God's people said amen. Amen.
but let it out. I can't keep it to myself because my God is worthy of all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. So if you've come into this house to glorify him, to worship him, Take your Bibles and turn with me to Luke chapter 1, and then we're going to turn over to Matthew 1. Luke chapter 1, beginning of verse 26. It says, And in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored, the Lord is with you. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, and she was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. Matthew 1, beginning at verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was exposed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, 
Thou son of David, fear not, take unto thee, marry thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth the son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken to the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, for which interpreted is God with us. There's nobody like the Lord in the known or the unknown universe. And I hope you came here with one thing in mind tonight, to give him the glory that's due his name. Yes. But not just today, but every day. Because isn't he worthy every day? Yes, he is. So every day that I live, I'll give all the glory, I'll give all the glory, mm, every, every day that I live, Lord, I'll give all the glory, yes, I will, yeah. Help me sing every day, y'all. Say every day that, that I, I live. live. Mm, I'll, I'll give, give all the glory. I'm gonna give all the glory. 
Every day I lift up my hands, I lift up my voice. Would you tell him that every day that you live, I'm to say you one more time. Yeah. Say been good to you, you got to open up your mouth and lift up your hands and say every day, every day, every day that, that I live, live, I can't help it, I can't help it, oh, I'll give, give all the glory, tell him again, this I'll day and every day, glory. say I'll give all the glory to you. Oh, let me say it one more time. Listen, church. Hey. Through the sunshine, I'll give it. Through the rain, yeah, yeah. I'll give it. When I'm in good times, I'll give it. or I'm going through some pain. of my life even though it's a sacrifice say hey say every every day that I live I'm gonna come and give it to you Jesus I'm gonna give it to you I'm gonna give it to you yes I will every day I miss my chance. I'll give all the glory. Let the redeemed of the Lord say one I'll more time. Say every glory. day. Give it to, give it to Jesus. Say to you. I do, I do, I do. Oh yeah. I do, I do, I do. Say. I
Come on, Jessica, say it now. Yeah. In the beauty of your holiness, yeah. of your power, I know. All of my days, I'll give you all the praise. Yes. Every second, minute, and hour. Say from, from the, the rising up the sun to the going to the down. Going I know you All will. My days, I'll give you I know you will. Every second minute and hour. To the rising of the, the sun. To the going down of the same. The name of the Lord is to be praised. Yeah. I worship you. Say, I yeah. worship you. Tell him, Lord, Lord I, I worship you. Early in the morning, but when I wake up in the morning, Lord, I worship you. Come on and say with me, come say, I worship you. I worship you. Say, Lord, I worship you. Say, Lord, I worship you. Come on, y'all, say, Lord, I worship you. To say it one more time like you mean it tonight. Lord, I worship you. Come on, give him glory. Hallelujah. Come on, let's put our hands together. My God, hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's worthy. My God, you may be seated. It's about that time to worship the Lord with his tithes and our offerings, church. Amen. Hallelujah. The special offering is for the media ministry. And we know that the media ministry has helped so many that haven't been able to come to church, but they've been able to stay connected uh, by streaming and seeing the services. You know, about two weeks ago, it's been about two weeks now that we've shared testimonies that you've given us of things that God has done. And I'll tell you, one of the common things is that everyone said, but God. They said, but God, God was able to get me out of this situation. There was no other way out. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. But there's also something else that was very common. Each person that wrote and said what had happened, they also said, Pastor Lopez, I'm a tither. I tithe. And as a matter of fact, there were two people that said that's, only, that, that's the reason why it happened. Amen. So let's bless the Lord. Let's worship God with our tithe. And let's bless him, bless him with our offerings. I believe it's uh, 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 Angelou who said, she said, no one's ever become poor by giving. Amen? Praise God. Let me pray. Father, we give you glory. My God, we give you honor. We bless your name. And so, Father God, we do what you've called us to do. We do it with love and obedience, and we sow it into your kingdom, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Oh, 
Come on and lift that praise up and give him the glory that is due his name. What a wonderful Savior. What a wonderful Savior. My God, my God. <laughs> if you can't feel his presence tonight, we need to pump some, I don't know, something into your system because he's here. I said he's here. He is here. And the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Why don't you say so? Why don't you give him a hallelujah he hadn't heard yet? Because he's worthy to be praised. Mighty God. Well, it's appropriate that tonight... As we talk about Christmas, the fruit of the Spirit that we talk about tonight is joy. I want you to just listen as I read to you from Luke 2, beginning at verse 1, and then drop down to Matthew 2, 10. Luke 2, 1 through 10 says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrus was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered, and she brought forth the firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. 
And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Matthew 2.10 And when they, the wise men, saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Father, my prayer is that people will leave this place with a greater joy than they came in with. And for those that lack it, may they find that there is an avenue to greater joy. It is not a normal joy that you give us, but it's an exceeding great joy. And I'm asking you to anoint our ears and hearts to receive it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. There was a poll that was taken not long ago by radio listeners and a disc jockey concerning what was the number one rock and roll song of all time. And it was interesting to find out that of all the stars and the crazy rock music, the poll revealed that the number one rock song of all time was sung by a British band, the Rolling Stones, entitled, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. It drives home a truth that has become very evident in the last few years, church. That song speaks like never before to a fundamental dilemma of so many people in our society and even in our churches who are sitting in our pews, and some of you may be sitting in this room. There are people on a constant quest to find something that brings us satisfaction. I want you to listen to some of the words of that song because it's going to take us where we're going in this Christmas message. Listen to what it says. I can't get no satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction because I try and I try and I try and I try. I can't get no, I can't get no. Listen now, when I'm driving in my car and the man comes on the radio, he's telling me more and more about some useless information supposed to fire my imagination. I can't get no, oh no, no. Hey, hey, that's why I say I can't get no satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction because I try and I try and I try. I can't get no. And then listen to this verse. When I'm riding around the world and I'm doing this and I'm singing that and I'm trying to make some girl who tells me baby better come back maybe next week. You can see I'm on a losing streak. I can't get no, I can't get, I can't get no satisfaction. How many of you are getting the idea that they can't get no satisfaction? I want you to hear though what these dudes are really saying. Because you can almost see the history of the last 40 to 50 years of the American life and a culture written through the lens and the lyrics of that song. And what it is saying is that at the end of the day, most of the people in America and all over the world are obsessed with the quest for happiness. They are looking for a time and a place in their life where there will always be a smile on their face and tears, no tears in their eyes. Where they can live a life that is kind of like the life of Disney World at all times. But what they forget is that Disney World is the greatest of all illusions. Look at the lives of the executives and the employees of Disney Corporation. It's revealed every day. And in John 16, 33, Jesus tells us in no uncertain terms, in this world you will have tribulation. You're going to have some bad times as well as some good times. And how many of you understand that deep within the corridors of our hearts, we know that to be true, yet we still try to behave like the lyrics of that song of the Rolling Stones. I try and I try and I try, but I can't get no happiness because happiness does not church and cannot last. Let me say something right out the box. Jesus didn't come to give us great tidings of great happiness. He came and he gave us tidings of great joy. Because we need to understand that happiness flows out of joy and not in reverse. Again, happiness does not always come and stay. Because how many of you have figured out that every day is not your favorite day? But yet you don't have to let that unhappy thing steal your joy. Sometimes even after we discover it, though, there's a dilemma. When we discover that happiness doesn't last, we move from one thing through another to try and try and try. What are some of the ways that many try to find happiness? Number one, we try to thrill our way to happiness. There is an obsession in this country with thrills. That's why we buy cars that will allow us to go faster than any state will allow us to drive our cars. 
It has always been a mystery to me why we're allowed to purchase a car that can go 120 to 150 miles an hour that we can never drive legally to be able to push it to its potential. In fact, my car will let me get up to 180 miles an hour, and I'm telling you, but that car, and I've been tempted to do it, to drive it at 180 miles an hour, but the reason I don't is because I know if I do, I'll get a blue light special. A speeding ticket simply because of the thrill. Don't you know that's why some people, they do this foolish thing like jumping out of an airplane and free falling from thousands of feet into the atmosphere with a little thing on their backs that looks like a diaper called a parachute? Listen now, that's why some people do this thing with a giant rubber band called bungee jumping. Others like Pastor Kevin... They climb places called Mount Kilimanjaro, ignoring the killer part. <laughs> and they put their trust in a guide who says, just trust me and follow my instructions and we'll all be safe. Now, I confess something, that Jessica is not like me and Shauna, another lady, Brenda. Shauna and I, we love the roller coaster. The faster, the higher, the better, whatever your thrill. There is something on the inside of all of us to some degree that wants an adrenaline rush. We want that sensation of living dangerously. We want what some people call that rush that comes when we live on the edge of, edge of death itself. You don't really want to die. You just want the rush that goes with feeling like you're going to die. Now, there's some other people I call fools. They're rich. Those fools, they have paid themselves onto the space shuttle. Why would anybody want to go anywhere where there ain't nobody up there caring about us? They don't want to know about science. They just want the thrill. People go to casinos. Maybe I'm talking to you tonight. Knowing that the house always wins. How many have lost your rent or not able to pay your mortgage and lost your home because you got caught up in the thrill of the roll of the next dice or the next pull of the lever of the slot machine hoping that today I'm going to hit the big payday? It is not a rational decision. It is the mark of a society that has embraced the thrill as a way of an approach how they will live their lives. And just like happiness, people soon discover that thrills cannot satisfy because they don't last. They're not an investment. And B.B. King sang it like this. The thrill is gone. The thrill has gone away. Then when it's gone, we go back to the song, I try and I try and I try and I can't get no satisfaction. Ecclesiastes 5, 13 through 14, the wisest man on earth besides Jesus, King Solomon said, there is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun, namely riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt, but those riches perish by evil travail. Secondly, some of us, we try to pleasure our way to happiness. Ecclesiastes 2, 1 through 2, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? Listen to me. For some people, and again, I'm talking to somebody in this room, listen, their quest for satisfaction leads you down a path of pleasure. And when I speak of pleasure, I'm talking about sensual pleasure. Watch me now. I'm talking about the fact, church, that pornography in the form of videos, magazines, and internet websites now grosses more revenue than the money that Americans spend on all professional sports combined. I was reading an article that said porn could have a bigger economic influence on the United States than Netflix. Porn is estimated to have an annual revenue between $6 billion and $15 million dollars. Let me talk to us for a minute. We have a fascination in this country with sex and the fact that some people are so preoccupied with the cheap, fleeting, loveless, but passion-filled encounters that are so much a part of our culture. We've got commercials for a little pill. I'm not going to say its name. We got other stuff. Let me talk to you. Then we wonder why in this nation it is overrun with teenage pregnancies, unwanted births, and staggering use of abortion as a birth control device. And once solid marriages are debilitized by extramarital affairs. There's some heavier stuff I could say, but since we got kids in this room, I won't do that tonight. But yet we have to realize, church, 
the price that we are going to pay in this nation for our high pursuit of pleasure. And eventually it brings the pursuers back to the song, I try and I try and I try, but I can't get no satisfaction. It is said that the great quarterback Joe Theismann allegedly explaining to his soon-to-be ex-second wife why he had an affair said this, God wants Joe Theismann to be happy. Do you hear the foolishness and insanity of people who pursue happiness through pleasure? Number three, some of us, we try to hide our way to happiness. High our way to happiness. In 2019, 25.8% of people's ages 18 and older, 29.7% of men and 22% of women reported that they engaged in binge drinking in the past month. 14.5 million people, listen now, ages 12 and older in the United States have AUD, alcohol use disorder. And King Solomon, the author of Ecclesiastes, said this in Ecclesiastes 2, 3. I tried to cheer myself with wine and embracing folly. And he kept coming back to this place. I try and I try and I try, but I can't get no satisfaction. Listen to me, church. Americans are the most chemically dependent people on this people planet. Even though we have many good medicines in this nation, we are the world's largest consumer of illegal drugs. 19 million people in the United States misuse and abuse painkillers, tranquilizers, stimulants, and sedatives. Why? Because we try and we try and we try, but we can't get no satisfaction. Number four, some of us, we try to buy our way to happiness. There is what is known as the Declaration of Independence. And in it is the famous statement, our creator has endowed his creatures with certain inalienable rights, one of them being liberty, the other being the pursuit of happiness. That was pushed in there by Thomas Jefferson. When I read that, it baffles me because it's interesting that Thomas Jefferson would talk about liberty when he bought slaves, bred slaves, and did other things to slaves that I won't mention. Listen now. And even though he wrote a scathing indictment concerning slavery, and then he stuck this in the Declaration not only did our creator give every man the right to be free, but he gave us the right to pursue, to pursue happiness. Now let me just say this, number one, nowhere in the Bible does it say that we have the right to pursue happiness. Let me tell you something. This man was a deist, and deists believe that the creator God no longer is involved in creation once the creator gives you life. So if you're going to have happiness, God is too far away to make it happen, so you've got to make it happen. Let me show you what our pursuit of happiness buys us. 80% of Americans have consumer debt. The average American is in debt to the tune of $342,695. The average debt is $38,000 if you take out the mortgage. Americans have 14 children trillion in debt collectively. Only one in three Americans have a written budget. Almost half the families in the United States live paycheck to paycheck. 19% of Americans have zero dollars set aside for an emergency. Now understand something. I know that there are some things that we have no control of and some things that are, are, are a necessity in life. For example, some of you that have kids and they're small tonight, let me really encourage you. By the time they hit 18, you will have spent $250,000. Go ahead and smile. And don't let me tell you that the cost of medical cost has increased by 33% in the past 30 years. But let me tell you what I've observed about many, many, many people who find themselves in a financial pit. It is because they tried to buy their way to happiness. Listen to Ecclesiastes 2, 4 through 11. Again, it's the wisest man who ever lived. Listen to what he said. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone 
in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired singers and a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I become greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. All this in my wisdom stayed with me. But listen to verse 10. He said, I denied myself, myself, nothing my eyes desire. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward of my toil. Now, don't miss what the man who had all the money in the world to waste said next. He said in verse 11, yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Can you hear Solomon singing? I tried and I tried and I tried, but I can't get no satisfaction. Then he says in Ecclesiastes 5, 10 through 11, whoever loves money ha never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless as goods increase. So do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? Listen now. He's not against you having nice things. I'm not against you having nice things. I like nice things. I like that you all look so nice tonight. You look beautiful. You look wonderful. But let me tell you something. What he's trying to get you to understand is just because you can buy something, you need to understand the one thing you cannot purchase is happiness. And when you envy other people, it makes you unhappy. And then when God allows you to get what you've been envying, once the new car smell goes away, once the house fails to become a home because it's love that makes a home, we find out that once we got what we got, we don't want what we got because we need to understand that it does not bring satisfaction. It only made us happy for a season. I have a friend who brought a brand new car. Well, he's with the Lord now, but he bought a brand new car, drove it one time, parked it under a tree, and let it sit there for nearly 15 years as it rotted. You can't buy happiness. He was trying to get satisfaction. Number five, some of us, we try to forcefully create our atmosphere of happiness. We try to forcefully create our happiness. I'm not going to read it to you, but Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8, tells us that no matter how we want to create and always maintain an atmosphere of happiness, you can't do it. Listen to what it says. There is a time for everything, a season for every activity under the sun. Now, I found out something today that really made me laugh, but it's true. Thousands of workers now identify as their company CHO. You know what a CHO is? Chief, Chief Happiness Officer. Now watch this. What does a CHO do every day? For Erica Conklin, CHO of a digital marketing startup, this month's duties included producing beer and jet skis for a company retreat to Saratosa, Florida. She deals with the employee benefits and payroll, but she also works late signing contracts for company events or listening when coworkers need to vent about what makes them unhappy. Now watch what I'm about to say. McDonald started the trend by promoting Ronald McDonald to chief happiness officer in 2003 as a joke. Then tech companies like Google joined the Cho CHO wagon. Le the late Zappos uh, chief executive Tony Heisa was famously committed to a fun working environment. His book, Delivering Happiness, prompted other business leaders to give priority to workers' emotional well-being. But being responsible for others' high spirits comes with a lot of pressure. Listen to this. There's the expectation to always appear cheerful. If morale sinks or the retention rate slips, the person with happiness in their title is likely to get some of the blame. CHOs often stress about their colleague's level of happiness. One CHO said, generally, I am very positive. My husband and my immediate family are the ones who see the not so great side. Another CHO polls her roughly 100 co-workers weekly so that she always knows the collective mood. She says, if there's a dip, we ask why. If it soars, we're like, what are we doing? How can we keep repeating this? I read that nonsense and I said, you know what? We have gone cuckoo because don't we understand that number one, no one else is responsible for making you happy. Don't we understand that no one is capable of assuring that someone else will always be happy because you try try and you try and you try and how many of you have seen that you've tried to make some people happy and nothing you do makes them happy first of all you're not responsible for it secondly you can't sustain it so let me quickly talk about why we have this epidemic of unhappy people in America number one many aren't even sure what happiness is 
Romans 14 and 17, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The Bible very clearly tells us that as children of the kingdom of God, that true happiness comes when we have a right relationship with God and one another, and when we have a peace and joy that comes through the Holy Spirit. But let's watch what I'm about to say. Again, so many believe that happiness is about right happenings. And so they base their happiness on feelings and the present happenings. Now listen to me very closely. Here is the problem. You and I need to understand that before the fall in the garden, we were inherently happy. It was on the inside of us. But now, because we have sinned, happiness becomes the hunt rather than the state of being. And many people are not sure about what happiness is. For many people, happiness is dependent on their happenings. And if their happenings are happening the way they want them to happen, then they are happy. Listen now. But if their happenings don't happen or discontinue to happen the way they want their happenings to happen, they are unhappy. Are you getting what I'm saying? Well, in case you don't, let me say this. There was a musical from years back called Oklahoma. There was this song made famous in it and went like this. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I've got plenty of sunshine. Everything's going my way. But here's the problem. That is not true happiness. Because how many of you found out that some days can start out going your way and all of a sudden divert and go another way? Listen now. Every day will not always go your way. Number two, we have unhappy people because many look for happiness in the wrong places. That's why even Christians sometimes enter into bad relationships because they're looking for and believing that if they can just get in this relationship with this guy or this woman, then life will be beautiful. And that is why a person can see the warning signs and still step into a bad relationship because you believe that if I just marry him or her, then happiness will come. Let me tell you something. If he's a devil, she's a devil before you marry them, please understand, multiply the pain. I'm just trying to help. Everybody say Merry Christmas. <laughs> Let me give you some scriptures. Philippians 4:19. And my God will meet all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Psalm 34 and 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Psalm 37, 4 through 5, delight yourself in the Lord and do good and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he will do this. Let's just add verse 6. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn and your vindication like the noonday sun if you will delight in the Lord and commit your way to him. Number three. Many people are unhappy because many can't embrace happiness because of overwhelming guilt. Matthew 11, 20 through 8 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me, you and learn of me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When I was in Bible college, one of my buddies was weeping and crying at the altar, and so I grabbed him by the arm, and I said, what's the matter? And he starts telling me about how when he was in the youth group, how he had an affair with the youth pastor's wife. Now, I understand what I'm about to say. He had been confronted. He had been dealt with. He had repented over and over and over. He just couldn't shake the guilt. And here's the great tragedy. Here we are studying to be preachers of the gospel, which means good news. Yet he could not receive the greatest truth of the good news. And that is John 8, 36. So if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Church, listen to me. Happiness is impossible as long as you live your life guilt-ridden for something God already forgave. Number four, many lack happiness because they are shooting at the wrong goal. Now, this one is the real deal. Watch this now. I was thinking back when I was in high school and I was a freshman, and there was a guy on the freshman team with me who would later go on to become a great, great, phenomenal forward on our basketball team in high school. But believe me when I tell you this, when we were freshmen, he was not a superstar. This dude gets in the game. We pass him the ball in the low post. He takes the ball, looks at it like, what shall I do with this? He takes off. He goes down to the other end of the court to the other team's goal. He runs down there. We all stand there stunned because we can't believe not only is he going the wrong way, but when he got there, he shot the ball and he missed the whole goal. He shot the ball over the goal. Listen to me. A goal is six feet long and three and a, three and a half feet in height. How in the world could he miss the goal? 
Well, some of you are shooting at the wrong goal when it comes to happiness. Let me explain this. The goal of life, look at me now. The children are just fine. They're not bothering me. Maybe they're bothering you. Listen to me very closely. The goal of life is not happiness. It is joy. Quit shooting at the wrong goal. John 15 and 11, Jesus said, I have told you these things that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Now stay with me for a little bit because I'm almost done. And since it's Christmas, I'm not exaggerating. I really am almost done. Watch now. Just prior to this verse, Jesus told them, remain in me, stay connected to me, and your life will bear much fruit. Why did he say that? Because for three chapters prior, he told them some not-so-happy things were going to happen. As they sat with him, supping together and having communion, he turns and he says to the guys around the table, before this night is over, one of you is going to betray me. Then he turns to Peter and he says right to his face, he said, Peter, I know you say you love me, but your love is going to be tested to the point that you will deny that you ever knew me because the pressure will be so strong. Then he told them in John 6, 1633 in no uncertain times I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace in the world you will have trouble but take heart I have overcome the world listen to what he says he tells them with all the hard things that will come with life I have told you so that my joy will be in you and it will be complete now I want you to grab this Jesus didn't say I told you these things so that my happiness may be in you and your happiness will be complete. He says, I told you these things that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Watch what this says now. Complete in the Hebrew is a neat mashima. A neat mashima. It means to be complete, perfect. There is no flaw in it. Jesus said, I told you this, that you might have my neat mashima on the inside of you. That my neat mashima would give you a perfect joy. It would get you to the place and you can have it if you stay connected to me. Watch this now. What is one of the fruit of the spirit? It is joy. Who brings the joy into our lives? The Holy Holy Spirit and Jesus said I'm giving you the Holy Ghost so that in the times when happy things get disrupted by unhappy things you're gonna know that it's gonna be all right because my neat Mashima is in you you've got complete and perfect joy complete and perfect joy cannot be disturbed by the circumstances of life it cannot be disrupted by the things that people say and do to you he said my neat Mashima it is perfect joy it is a Nehemiah 8 and 10 joy it flows out of you it is your strength so here's the conclusion of the matter number one find your joy in your attitude uh oh watch now surely the Holy Spirit will help us but he's not gonna force his joy on us you know what some of the some of, some of the, the the most some of the people I see that look the most like they spent the night upside down in a post hole, drinking vinegar and sucking on a lemon are Christians. Are you hearing me? See, some of y'all can't even laugh when I say something funny. <laughs> even when I'm not trying to be funny, listen to me. Joy is not automatic. There's a responsibility of pursuance of joy on our behalf. Philippians 4 and 4, Paul gives this instruction. Rejoice in the Lord always and again rejoice. Now watch this. When I was running cross country, we had this one coach. He was from England. And you know what he would say to us? He would make us run in place. Then we'd have to hit the ground and do some push-ups. And he would say, after we do one, he wanted us to repeat. He would go, and again. And again, and again, and again. Now, it took me a while to understand what he was saying. But finally, when I figured out, he meant do it again. That's what Paul is saying here. He is saying the first thing you do when trouble comes, rejoice. And then after you have rejoiced, do it again and again and again and again. It is to be a constant attitude that flows from the spirit-filled life because true spirit joy produces happiness. 
and both are a gift of grace from God for genuine joy. True happiness cannot be done in our own power, but it must be received by the grace of God. Nevertheless, if we are to do so, then we must yield our attitude to the Spirit. Bruce Larson tells of a conference at a Presbyterian church in Omaha. People were given a helium-filled balloon. And they were told to release that at some point in the service when they felt like expressing the joy in their hearts. Now, since they were Presbyterians, they weren't free to say hallelujah, praise the Lord. <laughs> All through the service, balloons started being released. The sad part is that when it was over, one-third of the balloons were unreleased. Some of y'all got some balloons you're holding on in the spirit realm. And Paul would say to you tonight, release your balloon. And then when you do, do it again and again and again and again. Number two, find your joy in your pursuits. Ecclesiastes 9 and 10 from the message says, whatever turns up, grab it and do it. And heartily, heartily with zest, great enthusiasm, enjoyment. I got to tell you guys something that really hit my spirit today. And I had to jump up and down when I thought about it. I want every staff member to stand up right now. Every, every staff member, just stand up. Stand up, all of you. If you don't stand up, you're not a staff member anymore. <laughs> now, let me tell you why I asked them to stand. Look around the sanctuary at every last one of them. For the first time in the history of Bishop Collins at the cathedral, every last one of these folks they do what they do with zeal, with joy, with happiness. I love them. God, they bring me joy. Y'all can sit down now. Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. was a member of the U.S. Supreme Court for 30 years. His mind, wit, and work earned him the unofficial title of the greatest justice since Justice Marshall. At one point in his life, Justice Holmes explained his choice of career by saying this. I might have entered the ministry of certain clergymen I knew had not looked and acted like undertakers. Hmm. As they used to say back in the day, whoop, there it is. <laughs> now, if you want a boring preacher, tough luck, said the duck. You want an unhappy, disgruntled preacher, I can find you that church but it ain't happening here. Watch now. Because now, number three, find your joy in the Lord. John 16, 23 through 24, in that day you will no longer ask anything. Very truly I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now you have not asked anything in my name. Ask and you shall receive and your joy will be complete. Stop right there. Number one, some of you are not happy and have no joy because you've never asked Jesus for anything. And then if you asked him for it, you didn't believe he could do it. So he said, why bother? There it is again. Everything you need as pertains to this life is in the name of Jesus. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want you to understand that this night, this Christmas, I pray and for the year to come that you will let God fill you with the hope, with all joy and peace as you trust him. <laughs> to the degree that you overflow with hope that is the power of his precious Holy Spirit. Now, Colossians 3, 17, and whatever you do, everybody say, whatever. Watch now. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through the Father, through him. Whatever you do, do it in the name of the Lord. Why? Because everything you need in this life, including happiness, is found in the name of the Lord. And Jesus says, when you ask for what you need, ask for it in my name. And when you do, the Father will give it to you. And when you ask, you shall receive. And when you receive, what will happen? Watch now. Your joy will be complete. Now, let me repeat the scripture I said earlier, Nehemiah 8 and 10. The joy of the Lord is my strength. You know why I'm repeating that? Because for too many Christians, and some of you looking at me, the word of God has lost its power because it's become cliche-ish to you. And we preachers are the reason why. 
because the word of God has become cliche as to us instead of being the life-changing power in your life. And thus many of us fill up our sermons with scriptures we have and we've made them cliche-ish by repeating them because we're more concerned about stirring up your emotions than we are about the word becoming living and so what we do is we get in excited we get a certain amount of scriptures that we use every sunday and then we put them in us so we can get you excited then we eat the microphone and we put a little tune into it and i want you to know that god is in the house now. and then god is going to do something for you and then god is going to to deliver you. God, God, God. And you know what the problem is? You gobble it up instead of digesting it. So you come away with a knowledge that goes beyond your head to an experience that Nehemiah 8 and 10 is true. That the joy of the Lord really is your strength. Watch now. Because some of us need to understand you need something more than an emotional faith. A faith that is only faith when things are going your way. She had one son killed on a motorcycle, another stabbed to death, a son-in-law died when his appendix burst, two grandsons ended up in prison. I just found out that the other one is back in there for life in Stateville Prison in Illinois because he killed a man and thought he got away with it. How did Mama Love survive all of that? Because she had a real faith and she had that real faith because she understood that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Everybody say joy. joy. Amen. Somebody over here got some joy. <laughs> Number four, find your joy in your present. Find your joy in your present. Psalm 118, 24. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Well, 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 well. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Let me go over here and say that. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Not tomorrow. Let us rejoice today. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Not next week. Let us rejoice today. Oh, I'm going to wait till Sunday, Bishop. Well, I hate to tell you this. There is no Sunday service this week. You better get some joy right now. The joy of the Lord today. Thank God for what he has done for you today. Thank God for what he brought you through today. Thank God for how he delivered you today. Thank God for how he kept you from what you didn't know you needed to be kept from today. Thank God for the car that should have hit you, that should have killed you. But God, thank God today, today, today. Oh, glory to God. Go ahead and sit down. Go ahead and sit down. I got one more. I got one more. See, let me tell you the problem. Some of y'all didn't come to church for a Sunday, for a Christmas service that would make you want to joy, jump and shout. You came, not just to sing Silent Night. All right, here we go. When you find your joy in your present, finally, find your joy in your future. 2 Timothy 2 and 12, if we endure, we also will reign with him. I can't wait. Get to reign with him. Listen to these beautiful words from Revelation 22, 1 through 5. They are the picture of why we really celebrate Christmas. Then the angel showed me a river of water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the street of the city. Each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. Now that's a place to shout right there. My God, the throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no night. There will not need the lamp, the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever. Let me talk to you for a minute, church. As you're sitting down at your Christmas dinner, you need to celebrate the reality that Jesus came. He gave you a bright present, but your future is bright brighter watch now Luke 2 10 the angel said to the shepherds when they were fearful at his presence fear not I bring you good news but not just any kind of good news good news that will cause you great joy 
Not any kind of joy, but great joy. Here's why. Verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Matthew 2.10. I remind you of the wise men. When they saw the star that led them to the Savior, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. The word exceeding means over above. Now watch this. You'll never believe this word. It means violent, uncontrollable joy. Woo, glory. See, that's why I make room at the altar. Because I might get violent praising him. I don't want to punch Lady Brenda in the head. I don't want to knock Dr. Hill over. I don't want to run Pastor Lopez over. Because I might get exceedingly joyful in the presence of the Lord. Some of y'all looking at me and I wish he would hurry up. I ain't going to hurry up because the joy of the Lord is my strength. Ah, come on somebody. And you know what? The joy I'm talking about, most of the joy that I'm talking about, the church doesn't know and the world can't handle it because they can't understand it. Now, Chloe Byron with Massive, Massable.com reported, in Jackson, Mississippi, Eddie Prosser was tired of the pothole that had graced his neighborhood for a year unfixed. So he got the city's attention by throwing the pothole a birthday party. The delightful display featured a festive birthday balloon as well as a giant greeting card reading Happy Birthday Pothole in beautiful script. To drive the point home, the sign also said, I've been here for over a year. Prosser told WJTV News that although the sign was intended as a joke, he really was frustrated with the city's lack of action. Finally, after the local news outlets reported on the pothole party, the city fixed it. Now listen to me, church. Celebrating a pothole is a strange way to address a problem. But in the case of Eddie Prosser, it was a change of attitude that finally worked. So my parting love shot at you is this. Is it time for some of you to change your attitude toward the potholes in your life? Instead of sitting around and resenting your troubles, maybe it's time to take a different tactic. The Bible says in James 1 and 12, count it all joy, my brothers, when they give you a birthday cake. Nope. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Maybe it's time to stop whining and complaining and throw a party. And a good place to start is with Jesus on his birthday. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. I said joy to the world. The Lord has come. Joy to the world. The Lord, come on, help me say it. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. If you believe that, say it one more time. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. We've come to worship the King. Yes. We're here to worship the King. Yes. We are in His presence. Come on. Just to magnify His name. Cause when we seek His face. Yes. All of His glory fills this place. Let it. As we were.
up your voice now. Right where you're standing, every head bowed, every eye closed. Today, my father told me that Chicago had a great snowfall. We're known in Chicago for snow, but we're also known for something that is very important. We're known for what is known as the Great Chicago Fire. And a great preacher preached there during that time, and he did not do an altar call, and he said, I will never ever do a service ever again without doing an altar call. I'm not gonna do an altar call, but I'm gonna ask a question tonight. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If your heart has not settled and made peace with God, if you have not made Jesus the Lord of your life, tonight is your opportunity. And what a way to give a Christmas gift to yourself because God sent him that you might have life and more abundantly. And you would say, Bishop, tonight, right where I'm standing, I want you to pray for me. I want to give my heart to Jesus. Maybe you've drifted away from the Lord. It's time to come back in right relationship. You say, Bishop, I want to do that. Either one of those, just slip up your hand right now, and we'll see it. I'm going to pray with you. That's it. God bless you. That's it. Just lift it right where you are, right where you are. Lift it high. That's it. We're going to pray this prayer. In either way, you mean it from your heart. Then you are right with God. Would you repeat after me, Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus the Savior of the world, who was born on Christmas morning. But that was not the ending. It was the beginning. He served as a man. He gave away his divinity for a time. And he laid down his life for mine. And I'm so thankful for the gift of salvation that I'm asking you, Father, in Jesus' name, forgive my sins. Let Jesus come into my heart and live. And I ask you, Jesus, to do that today. And God, your Bible says that if I confess with my tongue and I believe with my heart that Jesus is the Savior of the world and I repent, I shall be saved. I do it in the name of Jesus. Father, thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give God glory and honor. Now, before you're seated, why don't you just turn to the people around you and say, Merry Christmas. You may be seated just very quickly. If you're worshiping with us for the very first time today, we want to welcome you into God's house. If you've not stopped by our welcome center, which is the counter located right by the front doors where you came in, make sure you stop by there because we've got a free gift for you there from Bishop Collins. But most of all, we're excited because you came and you chose to celebrate the King of Kings and Lord of Lords here at Eagle Heights Cathedral. Family, let's just welcome everyone into God's house. Now let me give you just a few quick reminders. This Sunday, stay home, be with your family, amen? Celebrate Christmas Day. Then there's no service on Wednesday night, but we want you to come and join us on Saturday night, January 31st for an amazing, um, December 31st, sorry. <laughs> I'm already in January. But join us for our New Year's Eve celebration service. And trust me, there will be room for you. But what we need you to do is, parents, we need you to register your kids for the service. We have one at 6 o'clock and one at 8 o'clock. So make sure you go online and register your kids so that we can distribute our workers throughout those two services. Then we want to just tell you, you know what? Just be blessed with your family. You know, as Bishop Bishop was talking about, you know what? Let things go. 
just enjoy what God has blessed you with this season. Amen? Amen. Before Bishop comes and gives his blessing, why don't you stand and worship one more time? Bread of heaven sent out from the Lord. quickly before I pray blessing over you. One is a request, prayer request. The second one is I want to tell you something very important about you, church. The request is this. Now, you've heard me say that my parents are 90 years old. But I want you to pray, and I'm serious about this. I sent them, Lady Brenda and I and the girls sent them a gift that was certified to get to them Tuesday it's been lost they can't find it and that's it's important to me that it gets there so I want you to remember that in your prayers that it gets to them the second thing I do I want to do is I want to say something pastor Lopez leaned over to me and he says Bishop this is a great church these are great people let me tell you something I tell people that everywhere I go 
this is a great church. You are great people. And, and, and let me say something. Somebody said to me that, and what you have with your deacons and that leadership, that is unheard of. That's not normal. And I thought, it's wonderful for us, but it's sad that we're so rare, that we have that kind of relationship. And I want to say one more thing. I want to say that somebody said to me one day, says, you know, there are pastors that would die to pastor that church. I said two things. Well, first of all, they will die if they think they're going to pastor this church. The second thing I said is they don't know how we went through and got to where we got to get to where we are. And I say that because this pastor, this bishop, is the proudest preacher on the people planet. I wouldn't want to pastor anywhere else but right here. And that's why it's my joy as you lift your hands. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Eagle Heights Cathedral, it's been amazing to worship with you once again. On behalf of Bishop Lady Brenda and the entire Eagle Heights Cathedral staff, we want to wish you a very Merry Christmas. I also want to remind you to join us on Saturday, December 31st at either 6 p.m. or 8 p.m. for our New Year's Eve celebration service where the Bishop will be delivering our new focus for 2023. For more information on our services and our upcoming events, you can visit our website, ehconline.org, click the events tab and see what's coming up next. We look forward to seeing you soon. Merry Christmas.